All right. So we are one minute past time and coming back from break. I'm going to go ahead and pass the spotlight over to Marisa, Dr. Zapata, who will introduce the next set of speakers. Dr. Zapata. Great. Thanks, y'all. It was a great previous session, and I'm looking forward to this session. We're a little bit more action packed, so we're going to bear with each other while we hear a lot of really great information. This session is focusing on upstream factors in housing insecurity and homelessness. So thinking more about the prevention side um, that Dr. Kushel was getting at earlier today. Uh, we'll be hearing from um, Dr. Well, you know what, actually, I think for the purposes of time, I'm going to let everyone introduce themselves with their presentation. Rest assured, they are all amazing. So Dr. Wagner and Ms. Rails, y'all are up. Thank you, Dr. Zabata. Great to see you. And yes, excellent sessions. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. Uh, my name is Jacob Wagner and I teach at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, and I'm here with Aaron Royals. And Aaron and I are gonna share our work on the small apartment survey research that began actually before uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic and really has changed quite a bit as a result. So we were asked by the city of Kansas City, Missouri to look at the small apartment buildings, which is basically two to 19 unit buildings throughout the city's historic uh, urban neighborhoods along the Prospect Corridor. We mapped all the properties, surveyed the properties with students, analyzed building permits, looked at codes data, and then we did a series of focus groups and interviews trying to look at how we can basically better preserve and prevent the demolition of these buildings as part of the kind of interest in missing middle and smaller apartment buildings as an important driver of density and affordable housing in the city. The area that we were asked to survey is called the 1-8 cent sales tax or Central City Economic Development District. This was a sales tax passed citywide that benefits a historic area of the city, predominantly African-American area that has experienced generations of racial disinvestment. So this is really a community-led initiative that got passed by the voters and it impacts 18 different neighborhoods in the city. About 33,000 people live in the district, 83% African-American, 5% Latino, much, much lower household income relative to the metro uh, area. And about 22% of the families in the area have an income below poverty. It is a, just under 15,000 households and about 19,000 housing units. There is a challenge around vacancy, and that is specifically this other category, which is uh, vacant units that are not for sale or for rent. It is a majority renter area, and there is an existing rent burden. 21% of the renters in the area experience a rent burden, and 28% uh, experience a severe rent burden. So there are significant challenges in terms of housing insecurity already. These are some of the buildings that we surveyed. Just to give some examples of the small apartment stock, many of these are boarded up, uh, currently either being renovated or, or uh, in limbo in terms of not being renovated, and many of them are already on the market. We estimated that there were about 50 units that were immediately at risk. The one on the bottom right here actually burned during our uh, survey last, last winter. Uh, in 2020 in the fall. So it's about 2,000 units uh, throughout this area. The majority of the owners were actually local, which is an interesting finding, and they are historic buildings with unique challenges. Many folks refer to this as missing middle, but also as a sort of quote unquote naturally occurring affordable housing, which is one of the kind of problematic narratives that we find uh, in this area of research. The most shocking thing is that the most common a uh, permit we looked at after looking 20 years of permit data was that the most common uh, permit is a demolition permit. 
and that this is driving the lack of affordable housing, undermining neighborhood stability, and increasing housing insecurity. And during the time period from 2010 to 2017, there were actually zero permits tracked for these particular buildings following the uh, mortgage foreclosure crisis. And this really shocked us. We, during our focus groups, asked about it, and many, many neighborhood leaders and small apartment owners reported that there was a huge impact and a very slow recovery in the small housing market following the mortgage foreclosure crisis. We uh, did all this research and released it in July of this year, 2021, and just as the city's hotel initiative was expiring. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Aaron to pick up the story there. Yeah, so interestingly, when we were presenting this to city council, we were also interviewed by a local news outlet about the report that we had done. And so since we've released the report, it's received a ton of traction and it's kind of blown up. But the media has kind of spun it into, you know, this report is a solution to homelessness, right? And so there has been extra attention kind of given to this report because they think that this is kind of the silver bullet for the issues around homelessness and trying to help people who are experiencing homelessness. So in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go super into detail on the timeline, but I can kind of generalize and say, you know, here's some things that have been happening in Kansas City surrounding homelessness over the past two years or so. So a couple of years ago, um, we got a new mayor, um, Quentin Lucas, and he really billed himself as being a housing mayor. Right. So this is sort of his expertise. Um, and so when he came in, he had an alliance with Casey Tenants, which is a local tenant advocacy group. And he also had promises to create and fund a housing trust fund, which is something that can be used to provide affordable housing. And so uh, in early 2020, of course, uh, we got hit with COVID and that was really devastating and it threw everything further into shambles. People were already experiencing um, struggles affording housing and finding housing, and COVID just exacerbated that situation. And so then over the next 18 months or so, we had a couple of um, folks who were experiencing homelessness. They froze to death. Um, it was really devastating, and it really just kind of put the focus back on why we need to find permanent solutions and these kind of stopgap measures, whether it's providing warming centers or putting folks up in hotels for 90 days without kind of a solution for what we're doing after that, um, why that's not enough. And so that's currently where we are now. Um, we know that the eviction moratorium is going to expire soon. And so we're gonna have a whole lot of folks that are already kind of teetering on the edge with um, having housing and affording housing, they're going to be evicted. Um, next slide. So the city, they've been doing some kind of strategizing and um, some kind of work around, you know, trying to end homelessness. And so they've put together this report and it's constantly being updated. So, you know, this is something that's on their radar and our work is hopefully going to help influence some of the solutions that they come up with down the line. Next slide. Um, so with our report, we had 17 recommendations. And one of the recommendations specifically kind of coming out of the conversation of how our report was received, we knew we had to, you know, like straight on address homelessness. And so there's a couple of cities around the country. I know Boston and DC and maybe others as well. Um, they have something called a landlord guarantee program. And so this is a fund that essentially allows for landlords to have guaranteed kind of monthly income um, like through renting. And so with this program, um, you know, they can rent to folks who are more precarious and maybe don't have a ton of income. So looking forward, I'm gonna wrap this up really quickly. We know that there are at least 30,000 people who are behind on rent in the metro area. The city has a task force on multifamily housing preservation. So they are really interested in our report as well. Hopefully the housing trust fund is able to get funded and they're able to structure it properly so that it can actually be useful and effective. And then we at the Center for Neighborhoods are working together to put a working group. So we're gonna be collaborating with um, neighborhood leaders and other folks that are engaged in this type of work. And that's it.
Great. Thank you both so much and really appreciate your attention to time. I know I got lost. I was like, more, more. Uh, so really appreciate it. We're going to move into the next set of speakers talking about PSU housing and food insecurity, COVID-19 student experiences. Hi, thank you. My name is Katricia Stewart. Um, I was previously with the Homelessness Research and Action Collaborative as a grad student, and now I'm a senior policy analyst with a nonprofit based in San Francisco called Homebase. Next slide. Um, so this study was a follow-up survey that we did. Um, the first part of the study, which I'll put a link to in the chat, was a larger study looking at um, housing and food security among students and employees at PSU. And this was a follow-up survey of 166 students during the COVID-19 pandemic um, to assess the same factors and how the pandemic impacted them. So we specifically uh, sampled the most vulnerable students who were most likely to be negatively impacted by the pandemic and therefore had the most important perspectives. Next slide. You know, um, I think I'm actually gonna share my screen. For some reason, the PowerPoint didn't seem to pull up correctly. Um, so I'll just go ahead and share mine. Can everyone see this? I'm just gonna assume yes. Okay. Um, so for housing insecurity, we found that um, almost 65% of the students that we surveyed in this follow-up study were experiencing housing insecurity, 21% homelessness, and almost 33% had to leave their housing during the pandemic. We found that BIPOC students were twice as likely um, as white students to have had to leave their housing during the pandemic, and they were twice as likely to experience homelessness during the pandemic. Uh, for food insecurity, we found that 55% of the students we surveyed experienced food insecurity, and 29% indicated that they could not afford their groceries during the pandemic. One student described in this quote, living off of food stamps and food from um, the local food pantries, including the PSU food pantry, and that they're really grateful to have these resources, but that it was very challenging during the pandemic to feed their family in a healthy way because of the food insecurity that they experienced. Uh, students also obviously had a lot of financial impacts due to the pandemic. Uh, almost 36% were laid off or fired, and 30% experienced reduced hours or pay. And of these, 90% experienced housing insecurity or homelessness or food insecurity during the pandemic. So the drivers of those percentages I um, showed earlier of housing insecurity, homelessness, and food insecurity was probably um, this reduced income or lost income. Um, because of this, students were unable to meet their basic needs um, and were more likely to report that they had to withdraw from classes. And 55% of, stu of the students surveyed received financial support from at least one Portland State University emergency fund, while 40% were even unaware that these funds existed. Basically just showing there was a lot of financial need, but also a lot of students were unaware of the resources available to them. Uh, there were also a lot of impacts on students' academic progress and success, particularly with the shift to all online classes. Um, that was very sudden and in the middle of the quarter for most students. Uh, students described that the lack of in-person instruction um, made it really difficult for them and it made it hard, and the pandemic as a whole made it hard for them to learn and retain the information that they were supposed to learn that they experienced a lot of isolation and anxiety, which made it difficult to focus on coursework, which I'm sure is something we could all relate to to some extent. There was also a lot of impacts on students' social life. Um, a lot of students reported social isolation, particularly those who were housing insecure, experiencing homelessness or food insecure, as compared to students who were secure in their basic needs. So this is basically showing that those who experienced some form of insecurity in their lives also felt a lot of social isolation. Um, the health interferences that students reported, um, those who were housing insecure, homeless or food insecure reported um, greater interference to their physical and mental health during the pandemic compared to those who were secure in their basic needs, particularly with mental health interferences, which relates to some of the social isolation issues presented earlier. Students were also asked how they were managing the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and students re reported basically that they're getting by, but not doing well, and they're maybe not managing it. Um, students reported not feeling like themselves, not feeling resistant, or excuse me, resilient um, and not having hopes for the future. Um, 
On the other hand, some students reported that they had a little bit of optimism by how they saw their communities responding to the pandemic and helping each other out. But overall, the students, when we surveyed them during the pandemic, reported that they weren't really managing the impacts and they were just getting by. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Should we just jump in and introduce ourselves? My name yes, is please. Dr. Olive Lansman. I am um, um, an instructor, senior um, professional lecturer at DePaul University and affiliate of the Center for Access and Attainment at DePaul University. Hello, everybody. My name is Luciano Verardi. I'm the director uh, at the Center for Access and Attainment, director for TRIO programs and access research at DePaul University. I just want to make sure that everyone can see my screen. We're going to start our presentation for you today. Uh, specifically, we are going to be presenting on the vulnerable students, food and housing insecurity risk amidst, amidst the pandemic. And I'm going to let Luciano take over and tell you just really briefly about our center and our mission. Yes, this is. Um projects, uh, research projects that we have at the Center for Access Entertainment at DePaul University. Uh, at the center, we focus on determining what are the needs uh, and insecure needs, insecurity needs uh, of students and, um, and uh, our work looks into um, help students to get access to resources and obtain their degree. So uh, we provide services and programming specifically targeting the, the needs of historically underrepresented groups and um, historically underrepresented groups in academia. And we work on creating an assessments and doing evaluations of those programs that assist them. So this research is, is part of one of those projects. We started in 2017, working, running focus groups, uh, trying to understand what is the experience of low income and first generation students uh, in terms of food and housing security. Then we did a, a, a large survey uh, with all the student population um, in where we found that 42% of um, all our students were food insecurity and about 8% uh, had experienced homelessness that same year. Then we follow up in 2019, 2020, in the midst of the pandemic with a new survey. And that is the data that we're gonna be showing today. Uh, one of the key things is that we, we work using a community psychology model in where we use our research to immediately create action plans. So at the end of this presentation, we're gonna tell you a little bit how those two get articulated. These are the two base definitions where we are starting when to define what is food insecurity and what is housing insecurity. That is pretty much the dominant uh, way in how these two phenomena are being studied today. And Oli is going to tell you a little bit about the findings of our last study. Sure. So as, uh, as Luciana mentioned, we are not just looking at what is happening, but we want to really address food and housing insecurity among our students. We do strongly believe that students need the tools necessary to succeed in academic environments. And of course, part of that is adequate food and housing. We find those to be essential to college students' general well-being, as well as academic achievement. Uh, I don't need to tell you, you've heard it before, you do in research in this area. Uh, we know that the negative consequences of either or both food and housing have, um, are dire, uh, anywhere from negative physical implications, uh, but also on academic campuses further, uh, academic performance is lower, decline is in campus involvement, students are leaving before graduating, um, there, there's difficulty gaining and maintaining employment, among many others. Um, so in terms of food and housing insecurity among college students, statistically speaking, university and college students, even before the pandemic, experienced both food and housing insecurity at a higher rates than general public. 
Um, so we understand that this has gotten only worse with the pandemic. And those students who experience one form of basic needs insecurity, for example, food insecurity, are at the same time have, uh, you know, most likely to experience the odds of another, such as housing insecurity. So before the pandemic, research shows us that there are high risk of basic needs insecurity, including food and housing, and home, as well as homelessness, among, um, again, underrepresented students in college to begin with, such as Black, Indigenous, and other people of color, LGBTQIA students, students with disabilities, students with medical conditions, uh, students with children. Um, so I'm going to give you just quick highlights from our second annual report to show you what we have found um, in our students, uh, in our student population. So we were examining unique experiences, particularly in relation to COVID. We also compared student basic needs from previous year to uh, the following year, and I, we were trying to identify areas of institutional improvement so that we can, um, at the end, uh, meet those needs. So the study participants, we, at the end, we ended up having 1,956 students, um, and one of the criteria were they needed to have been enrolled at DePaul University from the for 2019-2020 academic year. Here's some basic demographics, um, so you can see what our population looked like. And the summary, the executive summary is that we found that 29% of the overall sample were food insecure, 35% of the overall sample were housing insecure, 18% experienced both food and housing insecurity. We also found that similar to previous presentation, that there were low resource awareness among our students. Um, and then of course, there was an increase in participant self-report of food and housing insecurity from pre-pandemic to what we call during pandemic, not after, since we're still in it. And this is what we found on our campus. Similar to previous research, we also found that there is a vulnerable population uh, or populations, and many of them are um, at intersection, um, sexual minority students, American Indian or Native American students, black students, students of color, international students, first generation students, students with at least one disability, and students with a chronic illness. Interestingly enough, we found that there were a few newly emerged vulnerable groups, meaning the students did not experience these insecurities pre-pandemic, but have emerged as a group experiencing them during pandemic. For food insecurity, those were international students, students that lived on campus before the pandemic, students with at least one child, and students ages 25 and older. For housing insecurity, newly emerged vulnerable groups, including female students, international students, and first generation students. We also found something what we uh, labeled leveling vulnerability, meaning these groups kind of leveled up during the pandemic compared to before, and that is undergraduates for food, in, uh, food insecurity and student age 25 and older for housing insecurity. So what we want to do, again, we want to put out call for action to be more creative and, collabor and, and co have collaborative solutions to address these needs. We want to continue sharing our resources and collaborate with others including other universities and community-based organizations who are working in the same area. And we also call for changes on a more macro level. Uh, we've been talking a lot about systemic changes today throughout different presentations, and we definitely want to continue doing that. Um, this is where we're gonna stop for uh, questions and comments. Thank you, everyone. Thank you both so much for that presentation. I really appreciate it. As a reminder, uh, we are collecting questions in the chat. So if folks would please drop your questions in there, we will do a Q&A at the end. Um, you are up, Matt. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for this invitation to um, share this research with you all. My name is Matt Fowl. I am a PhD candidate at the Evans School of Public Policy and Governance at the University of Washington. Um, and today I'm gonna to be presenting uh, on some recent research on the pandemic's impact on uh, low-income tenants housing security. Um, and I also want to acknowledge uh, my co-author, Professor Rachel File, um, who you all met earlier this morning. So I think by now, almost all of you are probably aware of eviction moratoria. Um, these are tenant protections that prevent landlords from evicting renters who are unable to pay their rent. And this was really the first major housing policy response to the pandemic. And so I have a little timeline here 
um, showing how eviction moratoria policy has evolved over the past year and a half of the pandemic. Um, and really we see that at the state level that eviction moratoria were um, implemented uh, pretty rapidly um, across almost every state. Um, yet three months later, back in August 2020, less than half of states still had active eviction moratoria. And today we have uh, only four states still with active eviction moratoria. And then at the federal level, the CDC uh, stepped in. Uh, so about this time last year, they introduced a federal eviction moratorium, which provided much needed protection to the many renters in states that had no eviction moratoria. Um, and then more recently, unfortunately, the CDC moratorium expired. Um, was uh, reintroduced by the Biden administration, but a couple of weeks ago was uh, declared unconstitutional. Um, and so right now we're in a situation where the vast majority of renters in the United States have uh, no real form of eviction protection, despite uh, the pandemic still going on. So our study was based on a community partnership with the Tenants Union of Washington State, and they have been helping tenants uh, with their housing through their tenants' rights hotline. And um, this partnership helped to provide us access to an administrative database of all the visitors and uh, the callers who were served by their program. And so using this database, um, we constructed a sample comprising those who had been served by the program in the years prior to the pandemic, um, and then those who had uh, received support during the pandemic. And so in terms of data collection, uh, we uh, conducted about 25 semi-structured interviews with low-income tenants, um, and these had all contacted the Tenants Union during the pandemic. And then these interviews helped inform a survey that we conducted, uh, again, with low-income tenants, um, those who had uh, been served both the year prior to the pandemic and during the pandemic. And then we also used administrative data um, of those who had been served by the Tenants Union uh, in the last four years. So we have a number of different findings here, um, and I will share a link to our public report where you can uh, read more about them. But I really want to focus on two findings here that are relevant to the eviction moratorium. And so our first finding here is that uh, formal evictions, uh, we don't find uh, increase during the pandemic. Uh, so we find that really despite these unprecedented levels of unemployment, that the eviction moratorium seems to have resulted in a similar prevalence of formal evictions that have been carried out, as well as a uh, reduction in uh, formal eviction or written eviction notices. And these are written notices that are um, given uh, by a landlord to a tenant, uh, which requires them to vacate within a specified number of days. And so while these don't actually represent, uh, you know, actual evictions that have been carried out, they do represent the kind of the initiation of the formal eviction. So the second finding is in contrast to the first, really, that we find that informal evictions and forced moves were more common during the pandemic. Um, so even though tenants had the legal right to stay in their housing, we often found that uh, landlords used these illicit tactics. And so we found significant increases in uh, tenants being told to leave their rental unit um, via text, email, or phone call, um, where uh, tenants had the locks changed uh, to prevent their access. Uh, that landlords had removed their possessions, um, landlords had shut off or cut utilities, and because the, the pandemic has been going on so long now that um, landlords had refused to renew uh, leases, which was uh, unlawful under the eviction moratorium. And so we spoke with uh, a number of different tenants who had experienced these uh, informal eviction methods. Uh, and one example is this older couple that we spoke to um, who had rented from the same landlord for over a decade uh, and was struggling to pay their rent uh, in full in the first few months of the pandemic. Um, and so they had asked for um, uh, an extension uh, to pay their rent. Uh, this was back in about uh, May of 2020. Um, and then about two weeks later, they came home to find that the locks on their front door had been changed uh, and they had 
uh, not been informed that this was going to happen by their landlord. Um, after contacting the landlord, they found that um, uh, they, they, they were unable to really gain access to the property and retrieve their possessions. And this, this older couple ended up um, sleeping in their car for almost a month before they could find a new place to live. And so what we found from our survey is that um, involuntary moves uh, doubled during the pandemic. So about 15% of tenants experienced an, uh, an involuntary move during the pandemic, uh, sorry, before the pandemic, uh, almost 30% uh, experienced an involuntary move during the pandemic. And then just by way of conclusion, um, I think it's important to highlight that Actually, this study was situated in Washington state, which has one of the most comprehensive eviction moratoria in the country. So what's happening here in Washington state is likely happening uh, in much more uh, severe ways in uh, other states around the country. Um, we also think that this really speaks to uh, how eviction moratoria need robust oversight mechanisms, as well as clear penalties for uh, landlords' illegal behavior. Um, yet we know that uh, prosecutions of landlords are uh, pretty rare. And then lastly, we know now that um, timely rental assistance is really crucial to preventing um, these evictions, especially now moratoria have mostly expired. With that, thank you very much. There's a link to our public report and I'll put that in a chat. And we also wrote a conversation article. Um, and lastly, I'd just like to thank our funders uh, at the University of Washington. Thank you. Okay, and we're gonna move into some, some question and answer. Hope those sessions, uh, hope the breakouts went well. You were able to learn a little bit more about each other. Um, so uh, <laughs> moving into questions for the presenters, once again, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. Uh, the first question is for the Kansas City folks. Um, can you talk more about what is problematic about the NOAA uh, narrative? Uh, we use NOAAH as a phrase a lot out here. Um, so actually someone used that the other day in a meeting and I had like a, like a traumatic reaction to it because I think the idea that housing naturally occurs is deeply problematic. Um, housing is produced, uh, we were just talking in our breakout room, it is part of our political economic structure of what produces housing and what doesn't, what do we pay for uh, with with the notion of, of for-profit versus non-profit, et cetera. And so housing doesn't naturally occur. It doesn't, it doesn't grow on a tree. We have to invest and produce it. And if we don't have that stewardship, that investment, it's not going to get produced. And this attitude that we have a lot of it actually we think is driving some of the demolition of the buildings that Aaron and I and our team looked at is it's not just going to naturally come back. Once it's gone, it's gone. And so I think it's a really pr problematic phrase. And I would turn it over to Aaron as well if she has other yeah, and I, I think so the area our report was focused on the CCED area. I mean, things are more affordable in this part of town because it's been systematically disinvested over decades, right? Like these are human choices um, that are built into the systems, whether it's lending or real estate practices or, you know, just straight up racism, right? So the fact that a part of the town just because of being east of Troost, right? That's kind of our racial dividing line. The fact that it's east of Troost, right? Like this is something that has been embedded and reproduced and reified and it's so durable. There's nothing natural about it at all. Yeah, thank you. Um, this is a question for the HRAC, the student study. Um, are there any thoughts on the responsibility of schools and universities to support social determinants of health like food insecurity and housing insecurity? There are lots of thoughts on that. Um, I think that that is something that PSU is working on. I'm not at PSU anymore, so I, I wouldn't have like the most up-to-date information on that, but you know, they did have the food pantry and some other food insecurity programs for students. Um, and I definitely think that this study was something they took very seriously and starting to figure out how to address those needs for students. Um, yeah, I don't know if that quite answers the question, but I think that that is important for universities to address. But this is also like, I think that's downstream from the issue, which is really the cost of education 
and the inability, like, and the way that all of these systems work together where students can't get the support or resources they need unless they meet X, Y, and Z criteria within the school system. So it really puts a lot of students in a bind. So I don't know if the university addressing it on the back end is really the appropriate solution. It's maybe a short-term solution. Awesome, thank you. Uh, and I see that we actually will be hearing a little bit more about this uh, in our session after lunch. Um, so looking forward to that. Um, uh, the next question um, is, uh, for Olya and Luciana, um, what are some ideas about col collaborative solutions? Um, how could they include local food uh, security and justice organizations and collaboratives? And would also love to hear from others uh, after that. Sure, we're constantly thinking about uh, collaborations on and off campus. Um, one of the goals of our project, our team, is to streamline the information, raising awareness. We're working with multiple offices on campus, such as the Dean of Students and you know other offices. Um, and then off campus, one of the collaborative big collaboratives um, that we are a part of is actually what led us here is the Kumu uh, Collaborative on Homelessness and housing insecurity. And so we're happy to work with others who are doing similar work. It's all about sharing resources and knowledge. Uh, in terms of locally, I know we're working, we just started kind of putting out fillers uh, for that, including our own um, depository, Chicago Food Depository. You have to understand that last year was not the best for collaborations. I think everybody was just scrambling. And while we did some um, work, like service learning and other, food related issues and housing related issues it was not as um you know we did not progress as much as i would have we would have liked to but that is the goal uh we don't need multiple people doing the same thing we we need to come together and all work together in terms of uh, helping students i think that collaboration is is key and and one of the reasons and one of the things that we learned in the last three years is that all the systems set in higher education to help students in need are set and all the investment is put in helping them to be retained and the systems are built in to improve their academics, improve, uh, improve the way they relate with faculty, improve the way that they feel better belonging and but there's there isn't much build around creating confidence on the students to talk about very personal issues like I'm, 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 I'm not eating well or I, I commute and the food here in campus is very expensive or there are no systems in place for them to have access to food or to have access to, to the, even even we put thousands of dollars in the system in general, in the poll we detected into meal plans into um, helping students to pay their tuition. But these students do not need to be helped to pay tuition anymore. They need to be helped with other things. So reshaping uh, the resources so that the funding that is being put in, in thousands of dollars to pay tuitions in scholarship that is, is not that much needed to be reshaping that into housing. Or for example, helping students that really need emergency housing. The, the cost of emergency housing in the universities is being put through housing at the campus, which is two times more expensive than any other potential emergency housing that they can get. So we have been working with the Office of General Counsel creating pilots to see how we can use either federal funds or the poll funds, and the money doesn't end in the housing. That is another university business, but rather help an emergency of a student. So there's no way we can solve this without collaboration. Um, so touching a, everyone in the university that either works a, in funding things for students to reshape that to this critical issue is what we're trying to do. Thank you. Um, the next question is for Matt. Um, what do you see as the role or hope of your research long term for evictions uh, for evictions work after COVID? Yeah, thank you. I think um, first of all, it kind of points to this hidden problem of 
in formal evictions that you know we we knew these were ongoing prior to the pandemic but i think we we assumed that the eviction moratorium was likely going to um prevent a lot of these evictions but we we sort of didn't we didn't um we didn't pay enough attention to informal evictions and what might happen if landlords were cut off from the kind of formal eviction process um I think more broadly, it, it also speaks to how we think about policy that might affect landlords um, and how that might alter their behavior and whether we actually have strong enough landlord tenant uh, regulations that uh, keep tenants in place, whether there's a, you know, a pandemic, a recession or uh, something else going on. Um, I think in many cases, uh, tenants just simply don't have, uh, for example, representation in housing courts. Uh, they don't have um, the resources often that they need to pay rent. Um, and more broadly, just thinking about how all of these problems are exacerbated, as um, others have mentioned, by uh, lack of uh, housing supply. I think increasing housing supply is essential um, to uh, lessening many of these problems. Um, and I think when renters have less choice about where they can live, um, that's only going to kind of increase housing insecurity in the long term. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, from uh, actually a question that came out of one of the uh, breakout groups, what should the role of housing developers uh, building in identifying and implementing solutions? Um, like for example, um, the building of one to, one to two bedroom units for lower income versus McMansion. Um, so what role, what's the role of um, housing developers and building in, in this work? Um, Dr. Kushel had mentioned that home ownership is the number one way for wealth generation in this country. Do we need to change that mindset? And that, that goes out to the whole group. I can jump in for one part of that. I think we do see innovation with land trusts that are looking at ways to build wealth where that wealth is portable if someone does need to move um, and that that may be a pathway of having renters have more mobility and more choice and also an ability to build some uh, equity and wealth through um, different forms maybe not home ownership right off the bat but it seems like there are there are innovations going in terms of community development around land trusts I think I have a, a similar um, perspective um, to that. I, I'd also add that I think, um, generally speaking, I don't think housing developers on their own have uh, enough capacity and resources to really solve um, a housing supply issue. I think only you know federal and state governments really have the resources necessary to build the millions of units really that are that are needed right now. Um, and also add that, you know, uh, there's lots of interesting research now on uh, kind of the, the racial dis discrimination that occurs throughout the kind of housing exchange process that often starts with housing development. Um, so I think we should be really careful of um, some of the more kind of traditional routes and think more, as Jacob says, about um, uh, community trusts and things like that. Yes, thank you. I appreciate that response. Uh, did other folks have any thoughts? Yeah, I'll just add that some of the work that I like that I'm doing in communities or that I see done is that, like Matt's saying, it often has to be cities or counties that set aside the funding or the space first, and then put out like um, kind of a request for proposals for developers to jump on and say, oh, well, we'll take on this project. And sometimes it's subsidized by the city or the city has to fund it. But unless you have a nonprofit housing developer, this is not going to be a solution. I don't think that comes from the housing developers themselves. Um, but like others are saying, has to come from the government. Yeah, and I can. Case, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to say that in the case of students and higher education, is the, the system is so not ready to address the growing number of students that are experiencing housing security. But there are thousands of federal dollars that are being not used every year. 
that the government only have like Edgar regulation that you know controls how that money can be used uh, had been modified during the pandemic to let us use a little bit of it in housing, but it's uh, at the same time it's very convoluted because you have you try to build a sustainable in terms of creating wealth. We try to build a sustainable agreement with a student in where okay we. We use this money to pay you housing for six months. What are you going to do in those six months? That is university services that is going to create this a sustainable path to independent living. Are you going to try to get a job? Are you going to be in a career path of any kind? Are you going to get an internship? So all those federal funds that are organized in, in, in a systemic way to help students to navigate and successfully go through their college experience are just focusing on making GPA on going to the university. And it's, mm -hmm. it's not the university that needs to manage that money. It's, it's money that can be built in a new system to help the student for independent living. So I will put the idea in, in the government needing to rethink the regulations of how this can this can be addressed. Yeah, I was just gonna say a little bit about something they're trying to do here in Kansas City, and it's sort of in a, a failure to launch place right now. Um, a few months back, they proposed that uh, some land bank homes could be converted and rehabbed and then rented out to folks who were transitioning out of homelessness or other folks that were otherwise in precarious situations. And so um, there's like 112 houses that are available to be purchased for $1 through this program. And so everybody got really excited because they were like, this is great. We have these houses that are just, you know, sitting unused and they could totally be turned into productive housing and help get folks sheltered. But then sort of geographically, yeah, I'm a geographer. So like geographically, all of these houses are concentrated uh, primarily in the third district, which is a district that a lot of the CCED covers, but it's also a district that has experienced this sort of long history of disinvestment and you know racism on all of this. And so you're like further concentrating poverty in an area that's already gone through a whole lot. And so here you have a city government that's really, I think, trying to do the right thing. And though the intentions are good, I, I think that they're good, um, the execution and really kind of thinking through what this means and how this could just further burden and kind of reproduce the, the bad things that have already happened. It's like that full thought, it wasn't like thought all the way through. So um, I think they're kind of revisiting that program based on feedback that they've gotten from folks like myself and Dr. Wagner and neighborhood leaders, where it's like, how can we, you know, kind of rehab some of these dollar homes and help get people sheltered, but maybe not reproduce the um, inequalities that like already exist. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of our presenters um, for taking the time uh, to speak with us today and answer questions. There are a number of questions that we did not get to, unfortunately, but we uh, are making a commitment to share them with the presenters and try to get um, some some answers uh, back to you all. That's great. Thank you, team. You really did an amazing job. This was a great event. Yes, thank you so much. <laughs>